So uh, now let's talk a little bit about Trikuda, our speaker for today. Uh, he's, uh, he's been billed as a limna, as you probably saw, L-I-M-N-E-R, which is an 18th century word for uh, meaning an itinerant uh, painter. And that's indeed what he is. He travels around. Uh, he's a very talented man. Um, and I know this is a bit of a cultural change for us in terms of the pace of this meeting, but um, I'm glad to welcome Chris here. I met him at the museum where he's working for the last couple of years. Um, and I'm just going to tell you some interesting stories about the people that he paints uh, and his life in general. He was born and raised uh, as a New Englander. A New Englander. Uh, he's uh, an author and illustrator of uh, over 100 children's books. Uh, his last book, Firefighters A to Z, was chosen as the New York Times best. Uh, sorry, that was in 2000. He followed that book with uh, two more firefighting um, books called Hot Shots and Smoke Jumpers 1 to 10. For a year he flew with the U.S. Coast Guard out of the air station in Cape Cod, researching his book Mayday, Mayday, a Coast Guard Rescue. Uh, it was during this time that he became uh, an auxiliary member and was accepted into the uh, U.S. Coast Guard art program. Two years later he flew with the Hurricane Hunters into Hurricane Ivan, uh, researching Hurricane Hunters, and a book called Riders on the Storm. In 2006, the United States Coast Guard sent him to the Persian Gulf to chronicle life aboard um, patrol boats as part of a coalition force guarding the oil platforms off the coast of Iraq. Um, my place here. Uh, so he, um, he, he paid, uh, during that uh, tenure, nine paintings and drawings from that trip were accepted into the collection, and over 20 paintings and drawings are part of the permanent collection uh, of the United States Coast Guard. Uh, in 2010, Chris wrote and illustrated a book called Arlington, A Story of a National Cemetery, published by Macmillan, if you'd like to get it. Uh, and in 2011, Chris inspired, was inspired by a black and white photograph of a World War II fighter pilot uh, and began what is now a three-year uh, odyssey documenting the war from the human perspective, creating portraits and stories to share with the public. For the past year, um, Chris has been situated at the Palm Springs Air Museum, creating portraits while interacting with the public on a daily basis. Future tour locations include Kansas and Washington State this year. And the tour will continue into the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. Um, I'd like to add that Chris, uh, again, is a man who uh, lives uh, <coughs> uh, a very modest life and he does his commissions. If any of you guys would like to uh, uh, have a, a relative or a friend or yourself painted, he does beautiful portraits that make a, would make a great gift. So keep him in mind if you guys look for something unusual to, uh, to do. So that's about it. Um, I'm very happy to, to welcome him here. I, uh, I'm off to the Antipodes. Uh, next week and I am happy to uh, to uh, leave you guys with best wishes for a very happy and safe summer. I'd also like to welcome my friend down there from Australia. Is he from Australia? Yeah. You from Australia? Yes. Yeah. Oh, look, uh, finally uh, one guy in the room that understands me. <laughs> Where are you from, man? Sydney. Whereabouts? Uh, down at the court. Whereabouts? Down at the court. Down at the court? Down at the court. H A M. I don't know. I'm from Manly, so maybe we'll see you down there. Okay. Well, thanks very much, and uh, welcome, Chris. <coughs> said I've been at the Air Museum it's actually now a year and a half I signed a contract for January of uh, 2014 for three months and, I'm still here. Uh, and I'm not complaining it, it's been a great part of the trip and and I've learned a lot and as we we're talking there's nothing like the desert for living because I come from New England and I could gloat over the last two winters, my friends back east, that, um, well, here's a shot of the snow, and it's up on the hills. I don't have any shoveling to do. Um, so I guess we'll just launch into this, and just, yeah. 
Yeah, here we go. Uh, and then you can pause it. Space bar. Okay. Um, William Demarest, the actor. Many of you know of him. Uh, I put that up just to dispel any rumors. We're not related. I get that question all the time. Okay. Uh, Lindner. Last night I woke up at 2 a.m. and I thought, how do I explain Lindner? Uh, for those of you who are at the museum, typically, as you know, I'm not in uniform today. Um, I wear a kilt. I discovered when I started this project at the Women's Memorial at Arlington Cemetery, uh, as we were talking about, the, the heat and humidity in mid-Atlantic is awful. And I also said, well, if I'm working at the Women's Memorial, somebody's got to wear a skirt. And uh, so I, I actually, I started working at the Air Museum dressed like this, very respectfully. And, and then the snowbirds went away in, in, in uh, April or May. And I was clean shaven. And when they came back in October, I had this beard and I was wearing a skirt. And nobody could figure out what happened over the summer. Uh, OK. Um, my influences, uh, a lot of you probably grew up watching or reading um, uh, Treasure Island, Black Arrow, uh, things like that. Uh, and they were illustrated by N.C. Wyeth. Does that ring a bell? Uh, anyway, this is a self-portrait of him. And this is a typical cover of his. Very dramatic, lots of action. Uh, and that's an example of one of the early books that I did, My Little Red Car. I had a very simple line style, very kid-friendly. And, uh, and I worked on a couple of projects over one summer that I, I had one weekend where I took a break and I went up to Lime Rock, Connecticut. I was living in Connecticut at the time. And, uh, and saw a race, and I saw the Skip Barber Racing School, and I thought, that's what I want to do. So at the end of the summer, that was my reward. Um, so this is the book that Patrick referred to, uh, Firefighters A to Z. The New York Times chose it as a best book. And that really launched me into going from the sort of cartoon style to nonfiction and adventure. Um, just a sample of the artwork. Uh, and the, the alphabet is A is alarm that rings loud and clear, B is for boots stowed, stowed in our bunker gear. So it takes you through a call. Um, a very easy format. Okay. And that's a sample piece from the Hot Shots book. And then this is from Smoke Jumpers. In all of these, I. I do my own research. Um, that's the only way to accurately do it. I mean, if I was doing the interior of a cockpit of one of your planes and I had the instrument panel all wrong, you'd be, you know, jumping down my throat. So I do the books not just for kids, but for the people who are part of that community. Um, mayday, mayday. When I, I did this cover, showed it to one of the Coast Guard pilots, he had flown in the perfect storm, and he said that's exactly what it looked like. So I was pleased about that. And that's a sample piece showing the rescue swimmer dropping into the water. Uh, when I was in touch with the Coast Guard, there was a miscommunication with public affairs. Um, he was under the misperception that I wanted to be dropped into the water and then pulled up in a basket. <laughs> I said, no, I can use my imagination. So, uh, this is my editor, uh, Emma Dryden. Emma, uh, she was 42 at this time. She had been adopted, raised in New York City, a very sheltered existence. And I would share communications with her from Coast Guard. And she wrote me back one time after I said, I'm flying in the Jayhawk, I'm flying. Uh, in, in their, their jet, and, uh, and she says, you get to do all this, this cool stuff, I'm stuck behind the desk. So when the book was done, I made arrangements for her to go flying. She was a nervous wreck. They strapped her in the flight mechanic seat. He's the one who operates the, the rescue basket. 
and on a day like today, you fly with the door open. So she was white knuckled. But 90 minutes later, we land, and the crew gets out, and she docks her helmet, and she leans over to me, and she goes, no more books about bunnies and ducks. <laughs> Uh, and this, uh, I continue work with the Coast Guard. This is uh, San Diego, and I spent an afternoon uh, flying with them. We went down, it was just uh, border patrols, things like that. And, you know, there are things like the black vertical stripes that you see. The, when I was flying with the Coast Guard on the Cape, uh, the flight mechanic was working on the main rotor and he needed a tool, so I, obvious, I could figure out how to climb up. What wasn't obvious was how to get down with the shape of, of, of the ship. So uh, he says, drag your toe down that black stripe. So that was before I was doing the artwork, and that was great, because now I knew I had to be accurate about where those black stripes go. Okay. And then this is just flying around San Diego. <coughs> Inside the rescue basket is on the right. That's just folded up, and there's the flight mechanic, and that's the Mexican border. <coughs> and border patrol agents, and then the unique <coughs> perspective of the airport in San Diego. So if I was a landscape painter, I would have a lot to work from. Um, yeah, Alpha Bravo Charlie, Emma, when she went flying, when she was at the air station, she said, why don't, why don't we do an alphabet on the military? And I thought, for kids, how do we do that? You know, and I went home and I'm thinking, B, bazookas, bunkers, bombs, <laughs> bullets. And uh, so I drew this quick sketch and, she, and Hunker down explosions. She said, "No, no, no. We gotta tone it down." So, uh, uh, a it shows uh, uh, an A4 landing on an aircraft carrier. Simple as that. Okay. And this is the warthog from that book. And then I contacted uh, the manufacturer and said, "I don't. Sh I haven't found any pictures of refueling of Raptors." So he sent me a whole file on that. So. That was where I learned that Air Force refuels one way, the Navy another. <laughs> uh, and then hurricane hunters. Um, you know, unlike flying with the Coast Guard where you just call them up and say, can I do it? And they'll put you on and, you know, whatever. Hurricanes, it's like, well, we'll wait till there's a storm. So they kept calling me and saying, well, we'll put you on the manifest. And I was a single parent and a young kid and I said, I can't do it. Timing-wise, like I said, I'll be down in late August, and as it turned out, Hurricane Ivan was starting. So there's the Herc, and uh, they, they uh, refit it with a 13,000-gallon uh, fuel tank so they can stay aloft for 13 hours. And this is leaving Biloxi, Mississippi, obviously a gorgeous day. Ivan at that point was on the northwest corner of Cuba, uh, Category 4 storm. And that was the spare pilot. When you're up that long, you need relief. And that's starting to fly into it. I had visions of just being gray and black, and it's not. It's just like driving, you know, we're having a storm roll through the air. And now we're entering the eye. Uh, because it was a Category 4 storm, uh, the eye is actually well-defined. They call it, a, a, and you'll see it in the next slide, and, and actually the next one, um, stadium effect, because the clouds are so perfectly formed. And we did one pass through, and I said to the drops-on operator, who's the one who drops the weather instruments, um, I've been in worse commuter flights, and he said, well, when you're a three or a four category storm, the winds are stronger, but the storm is more uniform, so you don't get that bouncing around. And not two minutes later, we hit a pocket. Yeah. 
So there he is, that's his station. So the tube you see in the foreground, that's where he loads the instruments. And uh, if you think about the hurricane being a donut, uh, as you enter the outside, you fire off a drop sign. As you then enter the eye, you fire a second one, re-enter the storm, third one, and then when you exit, you a fourth one. And then you do a, a, a quarter turn and you just go back through and just keep doing that for hours. And that was the ocean from 10,000 feet as you cross the eye. And from the book, this sh is showing the effect of when you leave the, the storm into the eye, the barometric pressure is so different the plane would drop 1,000 feet. And that's the end of it. The next day, they evacuated all the planes from Biloxi to Homestead, Florida. And uh, Biloxi was ground zero for that storm. <clears throat> and I didn't make it home. <laughs> okay. uh, another thing that I did, they, they uh, uh, spent uh, close to a million dollars refurbishing the Coast Guard monument at Arlington Cemetery. So I was there for that. Am I blocking your view? Oh. OK. Um, sample of uh, some of the stuff I've done for the Coast Guard. You know, the mundane things. This is me in the Persian Gulf, um, the requisite haircut. Take it down to bare metal, as they say. Uh, 125 degrees, 90% humidity. It's just awful. Um, <clears throat> this was typical of boats I, a boat I was on, the island class, 110 footers, and I just bounced around from one to another. Uh, and this is a painting that I did based on that experience. So in the upper left, that's the oil, oil platform, and you have fishing down straight ahead. We actually didn't have an incident like that, but um, using your imagination. <laughs> Uh, that was our, our gunny. Poor guy, we were, we were at the Kuwaiti Navy base, and he spent hours in that heat cleaning all the guns. And the day we left, in fact, that painting is based on a photograph, but we were re exiting uh, <clears throat> into open water, and the 20 millimeter cannon was covered. But as we were plowing through the waves and the winds were picking up, you could see that thing start to billow and eventually unwrap. And <clears throat> this nice young man from Nebraska who never swore did. Uh, typical, this is a watercolor I did of a fishing dow. And then I got interested in doing uh, Navy art. So this is the first of many that I did large scale. And I sold this one to a couple uh, who wanted um, something for their dining room. Neither were military. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and here's another one. I just love, you know, the, the, uh, the catapult with the steam and all that. And then this is a, a friend of mine, her daughter, when she was in Afghanistan. That's from a photo. So this is a watercolor I did. And then after the Persian Gulf, I came back to New Hampshire, and I approached Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center, saying I'd love to fly with Medivac and document that. So I did that for a year. And this is over in the upper left-hand corner is Lake Champlain. So I was got to fly in the left seat which is a lot of fun. Whenever we took off, you know, people would ask me, because of all the children's books I did, and I would do school visits, they'd say, well, you know, aren't you afraid? And I'd say, well, why would I be? You've got to trust the pilot, and you've got to trust the ground crew. They all have families. But I would still, every time we took off in that helicopter, which was near the physical plant and the uh, smokestack, um, I'd be saying to myself, okay, 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 not okay. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. So these are the next are just a bunch of series of drawings and paintings we can scroll through from that experience.
I came out to the Palm Springs Air Museum. I was dating this woman whose parents winter out here. And when we landed, I uh, looked across the, the runway and I saw the C-47. And I said, oh, we got to go there. And that's the plane that my dad flew in the war. So that's my introduction to that. That was death yeah, thing. Um, and then there's a painting which you gentlemen will recognize. It's uh, outside the library uh, in the museum. After visiting the museum, and uh, I came home, I had dinner at this couple's house, and the husband took me into the den and proudly showed me some artifacts of his dad, who's still living, uh, and one was this black and white photo of Griff Holland, P-47 fighter pilot. And I was so taken by that. The next time I went to the house, I just went right to the den, took it off the wall, said, Brian, make me a copy. I'm going to paint this. And he said, well, if you do, I'll give it to my dad. I'll buy it and give it to my dad for, for his 88th birthday. And that's the painting I did. When, it, when the idea to do the World War II portraits came, it was when he told me that his father he said, I've never seen him cry. He teared up once he saw the portrait, and I thought, this is what I have to do. And so I launched this proposal to the Women's Memorial at Arlington Cemetery, because they've got a great venue. And I said, I want to work in public, which I still, to this day, don't realize why I came up. I know why I did. But I spent 30 years in publishing working alone in a studio. So now I was going to be working on portraits, which I'd never done before, in public. So it was either going to be a big success or a huge failure, you know, crash and burn. Um, what's remarkable about, that's Griff on the right. Uh, and I borrowed his painting back because I only had about six paintings when I started this. So I needed to fill it out. And I knew from his son that he hated the Japanese. And, and I could say, hates, you know. And, and I would say, it's not for me to say. I was not in his shoes. But the day I invited him to come and see his portrait hanging in the collection, and as we're, you know, we came in with that usual Chuck Yeager bravado, you know, <laughs> we're in the Women's Memorial. What's it filled, filled with? You know, women in uniform and all that other stuff. And goes, women in the military are too distracting. I said, shut up, Griff. <laughs> so we walked down the hallway toward the gallery, and I saw three people standing in front of his portrait. One of whom was this woman with her two teenage kids. And I just, I didn't notice that they were Japanese Americans. I just saw the backs of their heads, and I went right over, pointing to the the figure of Griff in the painting, and I said, this man's here, would you like to meet him? And she said, absolutely. And I thought, oh, shit. <laughs> uh, so Griff came over, and he was very polite, and he talked about you know, being young. He was 19 years old when that photo was taken. And, and all of a sudden, she reaches into her purse. Her kids had wandered away, and um, she pulls out an origami heart. And she turns to him and she says, Mr. Holland, I want to give this to you. Thank you for your service. And the look at his face, he didn't know what to do. And he you know, thanked her. And uh, so I just thought, oh my god, Kodak moment. So I ran and got my camera and took a picture. So he's holding the origami heart uh, in his hand. Um, and as, as I was escorting him out of the building, he confessed, he said, all these decades I've hated the Japanese. And then he reaches into his pocket and pulls the origami heart back out. He says, I have to go home and frame this. And I thought, oh my god. Um, this is definitely something I have to continue doing. OK. Uh, so that I read this book called The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Harold Fry. Um, it doesn't matter what the book is about. I just thought that title was perfect. When I was in the Persian Gulf, one of the guys in the Coast Guard boat called me CG. And I said, what does that mean? You know, We're all Coast Guard. He goes, no, Crayola guy. <laughs> so uh, I, I wrote a blog, an essay, called The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Crayola Guy. 
Uh, and this is, in the foreground, that's the Women's Memorial. It actually used to be a retaining wall that was turned into the memorial. And Arlington House up on the hill behind it. Uh, I worked with the curator to get a lot of images. Uh, I'm always reminded of Marie Mitchell because where I'm stationed in the European hangar is the B-25. And that's the plane she died in. She was ferrying it. Um, she crashed in the Mojave Desert. They didn't find the wreckage um, until 1990, I think. Anyway, just another image. So what I'm doing is taking old black and white photographs and making them hopefully come alive in color. Uh, this was the setup. At the time, I called it the, the greatest generation of visual tribute, and I was doing men and women in uniform, American. And very quickly, you know, you realize World War, there are so many components to it. I mean, if I had a photograph of a little kid working in a victory garden, I would paint that. Okay. Uh, and then I had this wall, which I was working, that was just... I would take the images and paint on it, but it was a 20-foot section of blank wall. So I was taking a week off, and I left out paper and crayons and all that, and with a note saying, feel free to add to the wall. When I came back, the whole wall was covered with notes and pictures, and I saved over 500 of them. You know, uh, there was some great art. I, I did a, a presentation, you can see in the upper right hand corner, which is actually um, uh, Taiwanese. Um, people from all over the world came and they paid tribute. And, and that, was, that was wonderful to see. Okay. Um, I went on Facebook when I realized after painting Griff's image that I needed more images, so I just contacted friends. I said, your parents are my parents' age. Send me photos. And this was the mother of one of my friends. And I love the quintessential cigarette. I remember my grandparents' car having the same handle on the door. Okay. And that's the finished portrait. Mm -hmm. uh, I met this woman. Uh, She's 96 years old now. Lorraine Rogers, and we, we talked for two hours in her house, and, and she told me stories, um, you know, when she met Jackie Cochran. Uh, she was living outside of Chicago, and, and she went downtown, and Jackie was just at this table alone, and she didn't even look up. She says, logbook. So Lorraine hands her, her her meager seven hours, and she says, you're wasting my time. She said, I want to be just like you. She says, Get out of here. Two weeks later, she got a letter saying, report to Texas. Mm -hmm. While she was down there, um, there were 38 women who died in service as WAS. So it was an 18-month program. Uh, sadly, some of the women died because of their ground crew, who intentionally sabotaged their planes. They would put sugar in a gasoline tank. In her case, she said, she was flying along and uh, went to change direction, and the rudder cable snapped, and the plane inverted, and she's now spiraling out of control upside down. She said, I managed to crawl out, pull my ripcord handle, chute popped open, and then I hit the ground. I said, well, how did you know it was sabotage? And she said, my instructor, who was male, was privy to the accident report. But uh, Jackie Cochran knew that if she pressed charges that, uh, they would cancel the program, so they couldn't do anything about it. And that's her portrait. Uh, Peachy. <laughs> um, uh, we were talking about uh, how do we um, combine images and stuff like that. This is a commission for somebody, the man in the middle, Ralph DeCarroll, was a right blister gunner on B-29, and that was his plane. And when I finished it, I sent the image to the woman who commissioned it. And she was a good Christian woman. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have to say that only because she took offense to the look of Peachy. And she made me cover Peachy up 
Uh, I said, Norma, you know, you're messing with history. And she said, you know, but you got to remember Ralph's turning 90. I said, if we leave it like it is, it might give him another 10 years. <laughs> so PG ended up being covered. And, uh, and when I did that, go ahead. Uh, I met Ralph. There he is. And we had a private moment. And I said, do you notice anything different about the plane? He goes, yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, that's my dad. Uh, in the Arlington book, that's the photograph I use for the dedication. <clears throat> okay. And that was the kind of plane that, of course, is the Air Museum's What's Up Doc that my dad flew, the C-47. He flew the hump, but like a lot of men, uh, and I'm not just saying World War II, but a lot of people who've been in combat don't talk about it. You know, he talk, tells funny stories like you're flying over the Himalayan mountains, it's damn cold, and, and he said one of one of my friends, the pilot, built a fire inside the plane. <laughs> uh, okay. And this was, uh, I, I, I've flown in it twice. So that, my dad died in 1989, so it was kind of nice to fly in the C-47 and feel like I've come full circle with him. So that was going to Gino. <clears throat> just, uh, this is just a couple of shots. And there are, there are people who, uh, who work at the museum. When I told them I went flying, they said, you did? You went in that? <laughs> but again, you know, you rely on the pilots and the mechanics. And, and that's the painting I did, which is every day, uh, a tribute to that. And that's the portrait I did of my dad. That's from a tiny, tiny black and white photo that had been on his desk in the den. He, he had that, a 10-inch wingspan model that he built of the C-47 and his AT-6. Um, and then some photos I just say, I don't know what the story is, but I have to paint that. Um, he was a tail gunner on a B-24. I think if anything that embodies the spirit of World War II is, is in the cockiness is that portrait. Uh, I did one for a pilot. He, uh, he was uh, B-17, obviously. Uh, his name was Bill Purple. Uh, he flew 34 missions, eight Air Force, and that's Queen Elizabeth with, um, in the middle of it, uh, in the center of it, back to us. And that's the portrait I did Bill. Um, the man on the right, so I started the tour. When I was at the Women's Memorial, we had a lot of honor flights that came through. Does anybody not know what an honor flight is? That's what I thought. That I realized that um, I should take this on the road. And uh, so one of the first places I contacted was the Air Museum. Greg Kenny, who's our educational person, said, absolutely, let's set a date. So we came here. But I started in my hometown in Amherst, Massachusetts, and I set up at the town library. And I, and I remember thinking, walking to the door the first day, this is going to be a disaster. Um, I've gone from a memorial, military memorial, to a liberal college town. And I know liberal has all sorts of you know uh, taglines to it. but." Um, I chose the town library, library because that was the place where people come and go. I was supposed to be there a month. Sharon Sherry, who's the director, uh, 10 days into it said, you're not going anywhere. She said, I've never seen lifeblood, as she put it, in here ever before because I work in public and people come up and they want to know what's going on. This man, uh, Jim Ballard, called me one day after the article in the paper he says, I've got something you might want to see. So 20 minutes later, he shows up with two shopping bags full of paper airplane models that he's made. And he donates them to children's hospitals. And he was very cute about it, because he sat down at the table, and, and one by one, he's pulling them out, quizzing me. And I got them all right, because of course, my dad was a pilot who went to air shows. But OK. 
two gentlemen saw the planes, you can see the Corsair on the table, saw all these planes on the, on the table, and then they made a U-turn and, and stopped back. And Jim's explaining it. And uh, this guy, Alan Carpenter, he's holding an AT-6, but he points to a PT-23 on the table. He, he says, uh, rear seat facing backwards, gunnery school. I said, oh, okay, where were you? He says, Fort Myer, Florida. And then he turns to the window, blue sky, and he, he says, day like today, we're out there flying a you know, practice. And uh, I hear the pilot yell, because of course, you know, they had cloth helmets, rotary engine, no intercom, no nothing. And he's facing backwards. And the pilot yells, save your ass! <laughs> and he's, he's 19 years old. He's thinking, well, uh, well, all right. So he bails out. <laughs> he drops into the Gulf of Mexico where a, a boat from the air station picks him up, pulls him out of the water, and greets him with, you're in deep shit. And he's like, what did I do? You know, so they go back to the air base, and he's trudging across the tarmac, soaking wet, and the pilot sees him, and he comes over. He goes, Carpenter, I ought to bust you for insubordination. I said, save the brass. <laughs> the shell cases. Uh, this one, uh, the guy's holding the, he was 8th Air Force, uh, B-24. This little English wren had flown into the plane right before they took off. And he kept it alive. He, he put it in his uh, sheepskin glove and would feed it oxygen. You know, and then when it landed, they opened the door and off it flew. And that was it. Uh, and here we are back at the Palm Springs Air Museum. Now I'm officially there. This is, of course, recently when <coughs> Fifi was here. <clears throat> and where I'm set up. I always keep my dad's portrait near me, my easels over there. Uh, and then, typical, this is a commission I did. Uh, two brothers. And I always send uh, progress. I'll, I'll send a, I'll do sketch it out on the canvas and send it to them. And, and oh my God, the, the wife of one of the men, you know, she's like, his head's all wrong. I said, this is not a blueprint. This is just a rough. I thought, okay, from now on, I'm not sharing the first stages. <laughs> uh, the wife of uh, the son of one of those pilots in the previous one, his wife, uh, that's her dad, his father-in-law. Uh, this was funny. I met a guy. He says, I want to commission a painting of a Corsair, Guns A-Blazing. So this was phase one, and I, I sent it to him. He goes, no, Guns A-Blazing. <laughs> so I added more elements. And uh, so we have Japanese Zero, and now we've got, you know, the 50 cal, and, you know, everything's off the rail, and he emails me back, maybe you ought to tone it down. <laughs> <laughs> so that's toned down. Um, Stan Stokes uh, is as you probably know, is the artist in residence and has been for years um, with the, at the Air Museum. So I tend to not do portraits of, of planes. Or when I do pink planes, uh, as I say, you know, he'll paint every rivet. And, and I paint rivets like this. <laughs> so I, I'm more of an impressionist painter. Uh, this is a typical starting point of a painting. And this man um, uh, just celebrated his 90th birthday, so his daughter had commissioned it for uh, him. So he grew up in Honolulu, he was 16 years old, when Pearl Harbor was attacked. And, um, and he later became a radio operator on a C-46. Okay. Uh, this is an amazing story. Uh, Basil LeBlanc, I met him in Massachusetts. Um, he came up to me, I was painting, and he says, I don't talk about it. 
me pause. He said, because if I do, I tear up. And for 15 minutes, he talked about it. Tank division, Canadian Grenadier Guards, he says, and I was injured two months before the war ended. And as he and his sons were leaving, I thought, I want to paint this man. So I slipped my business card into one of the son's hands and said, send me a photo. Well, a week later, I get this wonderful black and white photograph. And, and I, you may have noticed it in the other shot of all the portraits, but it's the guy in the black beret. And I'm going to show that here. Phil, sorry. Uh, there it is. Uh, he says, uh, and actually the photograph, his beret is pushed way back in his forehead. And he says, you know, in his Canadian accent, God forbid, you know, if this ever goes to Canada, so now I'm talking like Southern, like um, if this ever goes to Canada, I'll be in trouble. He says, can you lower that to regulation high? <laughs> to figure? I said, yeah, no problem. So that's the finished one. Last spring, I got an email from a Lieutenant Colonel retired Canadian Grenadier Guards. And he writes, would you forward this email to Mr. LeBlanc and tell him that I came to the Palm Springs Air Museum and saw this portrait. And I w came home to Montreal and looked up his war records and realized he never got his war medals. And I'm thinking, oh my god, you know, here's a guy who doesn't want to talk about it, now the Canadian government is after him. <laughs> so two days later, I finally hear from Basil, and he said, I've talked to Henry, the man from Montreal, and uh, he, he said uh, he wants me to come to Montreal for a ceremony. He says, if that's happening, then you have to be there, because if you hadn't done the portrait, none of this would happen. Sure. So we finally made arrangements, and uh, last November, Remembrance Day weekend, we all went to Montreal. All of his kids from all over had showed up. And uh, I knew in advance that this was going to be a big day because not only was he getting his ribbons, he was also going to be issued his wound stripe, like our Purple Heart. And that made sense because, of course, I knew he was injured you know, in the tank. So he, I drove up with him and his family from Boston, and he says, I can't wait for this to be over. And I said, no, that's not true. I understand you may not want to talk, but you're going to savor every moment. The day of the ceremony, the armory, the Canadian Grenadier Guards is half filled with men and women in uniform and, you know, pomp and circumstance. And, and he's wearing his beret with his cap badge, and he's now wearing his ribbons, and, and I, I see him get his wound stripe. And he steps up to the podium, and he tells us the day he was injured. He was loading the, the, the uh, shell into the main uh, cannon. It jams. The, sh the casing falls out, cordite everywhere. Now they're down to two machine guns, and one of those jams. So he says, I had the foresight to put on the, the leather gauntlet, and I reached into the breech and tried to dislodge the bullet, and it cooked off, and it ripped the tips of his fingers off. He said, we had just gotten through painting the interior of the tank. By the way, how many of you have seen the movie Fury? Okay. So it was the same tank, the Sherman tank. And uh, he said, there was just blood everywhere. So he's pulled out of there, he's taken to uh, a field hospital where a medic accused him of self-inflicting the wound. And he said, I was numb, not only by what happened, he said, but I saw my commanding officer being carried by, missing a leg, and he never said anything. It was a clerical error. That was the only reason he never got his war medals. So for 70 years, he carried the guilt that they thought that he was a coward. So it was, yeah, actually we can show some of the um, pictures. There he is with two of his sons uh, outside the armory, and this was part of the ceremony. And he's being interviewed. Um, he was the poster boy for Remembrance Day. Um, Global Network News filmed him for like six hours. And Okay. 
So then I brought the painting up, of course, to share. And this is the, the moment he's talking about his injury. That's his daughter and his wife there. So there was not a dry eye in that house at that moment. Um, our own T28. Uh, I just thought, well, I had an unusual size canvas, so I thought, what well, a Um, one of the guys in our video, uh, John Blythe, who is an American who flew photo reconnaissance in a Spitfire, so I did his portrait. Uh, what does this have to do with airplanes? This guy was so determined to become a pilot in World War II, he went all over the U.S., kept getting turned down for color blindness, and drove up his motorcycle up to Montreal and then over to Toronto, and he never flew. But he, he loved his motorcycle. Um, this was, uh, uh, she was an ATA pilot. Uh, one of our docents had looked after her later on in life. And so just another aspect of, of the war. Um, some of you guys recognize that photo. Um, uh, Franz Stiegler. There's a book called The Higher Call. How many of you have heard of that or read it? Yeah. So it's a wonderful story about an encounter. Uh, Charlie Brown was a B-17 bomber pilot on a run into uh, Bremerton, I believe. And the plane is severely damaged by flak. In fact, uh, it, it severs the oxygen and they all pass out. He manages to wake up and pull that plane out of its steep dive. And now they're limping along at 500 feet. They pass over an air base, a German air base, where Franz Stiegler is getting his ME-109 rearmed and refueled. And he sees that plane and he thinks, oh, that's an easy kill. I'll get two points and the Iron Cross. So he takes off after it. And he soon realizes the state that it's in. And he, his father had been a World War I pilot. Chivalry was the word that came to mind. He said, that was the moment I knew I couldn't shoot it down. He ends up escorting that plane beyond German artillery at his own risk because at 500 feet, his tail numbers could be spotted and turned in the SS, and that's it. Decades after the war, Charlie Brown, using the internet, is trying to figure out who this German was. And Charlie was living in Seattle, Washington at the time, and he tracks Franz Stiegler down 140 miles north in Vancouver, BC. And they meet and become best friends. So I did his portrait. And uh, every day, somebody would come up and say, is that Jimmy Stewart? <laughs> um, Bill Oliver is one of our docents. He's 94 years old. He flew the B-17, but um, he never made it over to England. Uh, he was supposed to ship on May 10th, and as you know, the war ended two days before that. And then he was retrained on the 29th in the war in the Pacific, and it's, <laughs> he's, he's been left standing on the altar twice. But that was a commission I did for him. And that's Bill last year, right before his ride in the uh, Mustang. He, he said he spent an hour in it, and they went over Salt and Sea, 11,000 feet, did you know, loops and rolls and all that. He, he was just a kid in a candy store. Um, that's a recent commission. Uh, this one, uh, how are we doing for time? This one. Oh, all right. Uh, last year, uh, I was Googling something, and uh, this image popped up. There was no information about it. And I thought, that is a cool photograph. I mean, nothing says war-weary veteran more than this one. And I just went ahead and painted it. And then I started researching found out, because I thought, well, maybe, you know, it's color photographs, and maybe by 1944, the Japanese Imperial Navy's kind of decimated. Maybe they're just flying air-to-ground missions, so they don't need the oxygen mass. So maybe 
you know, permission to grow the beard because that's an American Hellcat. And uh, I didn't know until later that you know the other clue to not being an American is his harness. Uh, so, so I do the portrait, and uh, then I find out I, I write to a museum in England and um, find out that he was a New Zealander who flew the Hellcat which the British Royal Navy leased. Uh, the tragedy is that he was shot down in January 45 over Palm Bank, Sumatra, taken prisoner. And two days after, or within a couple of days after Japan signed their surrender, he and eight other airmen were marched out of the prison camp in Singapore, down to the beach, and beheaded. Their bodies dumped in a boat and sunk. And that was that was like a shock because I felt like I knew this guy and I wanted to share that image with his family and you know I felt also that rage and that understanding that um, any veteran who's been in war how hatred can linger but I also had to tell myself that was 70 years ago I wasn't even around and he's long gone uh, so I, I keep Jack Haverfield uh, his portrait near me well, because a lot of people say, is that you? <laughs> so you got to do the math. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then one day, about three months ago, uh, a guy came up to me and he just said, give me your business card. I'm going to send you the coolest photograph. That night, that's what I opened up. And I thought, if that isn't the coolest photograph, the guy smoking a pipe, reading a book, getting a haircut between missions. And you can see the barbering tools in, in the foreground. And, and the guy cutting his hair, uh, it's like right out of that series, Peaky Blinders. Um, so so I, I started working on the portrait. And this one I decided to do large. It had to be large. It's the same size as this one. And that's the finished product. I added the bicycle because, of course, in England, that's how everybody got around. And then he sends me the same guy. And he, he didn't know who the, the Spitfire pilot was. I actually put that on Facebook. Somebody asked, what's he reading? Somebody figured that out. And along with that was the link to the pilot, who turned out to be survived the war and was, uh, went out to fly with the uh, Red Arrows. So he sends me this one, and I said, well, who is he? He said, I don't know. <laughs> but I liked, you know, it sort of fit the spirit of the last one. And uh, one of our intrepid docents found out who he was. And uh, uh, so I did that painting also on a large scale. And I would say, forget the uniform, forget the circumstances. I would have a beer with this guy. And, and really, a lot of what I'm doing is humanizing the war and saying, you know, we were all pawns in it. You know, we were told what to do, and you know, you have to do your job. Okay. My sister-in-law recommended um, I read this book. Uh, it's a story about a 16-year-old Japanese girl, contemporary, who's writing a diary. And the other half of the story is a woman in, who lives in British Columbia, one of the islands, who one day, two years after the tsunami, finds the diary that this little girl, young girl, has written. So the story alternates between the, the two voices. You'll see where it says a tale, to the right of it is a plane plunging. Her story uh, connected to that is her great uncle was a kamikaze pilot. And she refers to him as Haruki number one. Her father was Haruki number two. And Haruki number one was always writing letters, you know, praising the emperor, this, you know, to, to home, right? So then he writes one final letter in French because his mother, both he and his mother are, are bilingual. And in it he says, 
it, it bothers me that I'm leaving a grieving mother behind. I don't have it in me to add any more grieving mothers. So therefore, I'm going to uh, nudge my control stick and just plunge into the sea. I'm not going to strike an American ship and take any more lives. And I thought, did that really happen? So I wrote to her, wrote to her publicist, and she said, I don't know if it's based on any one person, but I thought, just the idea, if there were 4,000 comic, trained Kamikaze pilots, there has to be at least one. And so I started Googling images, and I ran across this photo. And that boy holding the puppy uh, was 17 years old. Out of the 4,000, 3,000 of them were boy pilots and didn't really know, you know, they, didn't, they were told lies. They were told that if they didn't strike the ships, those people were going to attack the island and kill their families. And we know about the women who jumped off cliffs with their babies because of that rumor. Uh, so uh, the next day, they all died. That was their mission. So I thought, all right, this is, you know, and before I, I so I want to myself, I want to paint this. But I, I put feelers out around the museum. You know, how do you feel about seeing a kamikaze portrait? And everybody uh, said, do it. And uh, we all know Annie. Her husband, she told me yesterday, and this is, he's what, 94? Um, and I know of his prejudices, and again, I don't pass judgment. But she said, I, I have to tell you this. He said, he, he said, Annie, come here, I want to show you something. And he brought her over to this painting. And he told her the story. And he had tears in his eyes. And I thought, that's remarkable. You know, if I can affect change like that, that's huge. So that's, this is my, um, unlikely pilgrimage. And I think there's one final image that you'll all appreciate. Oh, that one's it. Um, one more. There. <laughs> in my, uh, in my, my, my dreams, this is how I'd like to tour the country. <laughs> anyway, uh, any questions or uh, whatever? I have cards if you want to. Thank you. cards out if you would like a commission or if not uh, link to the website because I've been writing blogs about these stories so thank you very much thank you Patrick well, well,